I always am. I, I like tech, and I like <laughs> really. Yeah, so you go online, and I live online. I like to explore. I'm curiosity is my uh, is your mic. That's your here's your tea. Whatever. Make yourself comfortable. I don't know that you'll I, need a I headset. Did, you'll be I able did, to hear right, us. Right about a year before he died, I went to. I took. Cheryl and my kids diving in Cuba. In Cuba. Right. And we uh, we went and spent a day with Fidel at his home. And I we asked him, what do you do now? Because he had retired. And he said, I'm just on the internet Jackie, all day. Can you he said, you don't closer. believe how many things yeah. are on the internet. Do you mind pulling your mic closer to for when we start? <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah. Let's start it. Here we go. This is Howie Mandel Does Stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. I'm his daughter, Jacqueline Schultz. Guess who's here? Um, guess. Perhaps. We want me to guess? Yeah. Uh, RFK Jr. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I was going to try to think of something clever and yeah, funny. But I was just thinking a lot of people uh, <laughs> listen to the audio and they don't watch the video. It's on YouTube also. And uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for taking. I know that you're busy, crazy busy. But uh, I'm glad that you're taking the time to do this. Uh, you, you were, you were uh, regaling us with a story about going scuba diving and talking <laughs> to Fidel Castro. That's not like normal. A lot of the people we have on don't have those same kind of stories. A lot of the people that we've had on have not sat down with Fidel Castro. Most of them. <laughs> well, you I'm, very, I'm very, very happy to be here. And thanks for, thanks for inviting me to be on the show. I'm excited to... Uh, about talking to both of you. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. I got questions, and 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 some of them. You're taking a you get a call coming in. Oh. This just in. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm turning it off. Oh, you're turning it off. So, I got my first question is this: You're running for the president of the United States. You want to be the president of the United States. You want to be the president of the United States, right? Right. Okay. You want to. So, Why? W yes. Why? <laughs> Why? Why is a good question. Let's start with that. Well, you know, I didn't spend my lifetime thinking that I should be president or wanting to. And um, it was really during the pandemic, I just started thinking, because I was being very, very heavily censored during the pandemic. So I was removed from Instagram. I was, um, I, I was, you know, I had been on, at, at one point I had a very, uh, you know, big presence on mainstream media. I was publishing uh, very often in the New York Times and, all the other mainstream newspapers and um, and I was you know I was a frequent guest on, on on every side on Fox and on CNN MSNBC and all the networks and then when I started saying things that were controversial about the lockdowns and other things I was censored very heavily and I was removed my Instagram account that had an, almost a million followers on it was removed. Um, and I was, you know, I, I had a, a book out at, on Anthony Fauci that was not, didn't get a single review, although it, it sold a million copies within three months. It was the biggest bestseller of the year, 17 weeks, the top bestseller, and yet it didn't get a single review, and I wasn't allowed on any television show to talk about it. Oh, I, I was watching a lot of this, and I and, and the war started, um, and I, you know, had a lot of objections to the war in Ukraine, and I, but I couldn't talk about any of these things. So I, I thought, you know, if I was running for president, I have a big enough following that I could qualify for the debates, and I could raise enough money that they'd have to let me on the debates and um, and let me talk to the American people for the first time. And that, but it wasn't a real, it wasn't like a notion that I was gonna do, it was just an idea. And, and a guy called uh, uh, Jeremy Zogby, who runs one of the biggest polling firms in the country, contacted me, I'd never met him before, but he had been polling my name, just throwing my name into a lot of different polls across the country. And the results were, were really astonishing, despite the fact and I'd had thousands of articles written about me, all of them negative, literally for for five years, I didn't get a single good article and I had thousands and thousands of attacks and mischaracterizations. 
Uh, my assumption was that among the general public, my polling would be as low as you could get in the negative, probably. And but it, it wasn't. It was actually in terms of popularity, it was ahead of anybody that they were polling, which astonished me. And the, the polling, and and I've I've read a little bit about the polling. The polling was isn't it amongst independents though, right? No, this was polling. I didn't know he was doing this polling, and he did a, he did several different kinds of polls. He did poll. He polled me among Democrats, among and then among the general electorate to see elect, to see how I would do in a primary, right, and then to see how I do in a general election, and then just favorability rating ratings. My favorability was ahead of it was the number one person. It, it, there was about twenty eight people like DeSantis and Trump and Biden, but they also had Pope Francis on there. They had Elon Musk. They had Greta Thornburg, and you know people who were pretty popular. But my popularity rating, my favorability rating, was higher than anybody's, which shocked me. And I thought, well, you know, a lot of these people who they're asking probably think they're my dad, that I'm my dad. Right. Uh, there's probably a number of people Your out name, there, your brand is... Right. Who, you know, because anybody who read any article for that five-year period would have a negative point of view of me. So then we did some more. He, he, he was trying to convince me to run, which I was hadn't, really didn't have any... Uh, I, Aspiration? In, no. And then when the war started, um, I was I was pretty alarmed that the Democratic Party had now become the pro-war party. The Democratic Party was always anti-war, and I saw why it was happening. That you know their funding was all coming from Raytheon and General Dynamics and uh, and Lockheed and Boeing and Northrop Grumman and BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard. All of these big companies that make they're living, make money, you know, part of the military industrial complex. So you believe that that is the reason that the Democratic Party is pro-war and not because they are trying to defend democracy? Yeah, well, you know, listen, every war says they're trying to defend democracy. And then they have, you know, each time, this is what Eisenhower warned us about, you know, on, on January 17th, 1961 was my birthday, I, my birthday, and my uncle was about to take the oath of office in three days, which I attended. And Eisenhower made this, in, this extraordinary speech and probably we should regard it as the most important speech in American history, where he warned America about the about the emergence of a military industrial complex that would transform our exemplary democracy uh, into a imperium abroad with endless wars and, uh, and a, a security state, a surveillance state at home. And um, my uncle during his thousand days in office, you know, he can't, he immediately realized this is what was happening during the pigs invasion when the military, his joint chiefs of staff and the CIA just lied to him to his face about the Bay of Pigs because he didn't want to go into the Bay of Pigs, but he'd only been in office three and a half months and he ended up the Senate, you know, allowing them to leave. He wouldn't let them use any military equipment from the United States. Uh, that we wouldn't provide, provide them ships. United Fruit gave them the ships. And then when they were dying on the beach, those men, which they had promised, which Dulles and you know Lemonser and uh, and Lucius Clay and all the Joint Chiefs had promised him was not going to happen, he took publicly took the blame. But privately, he said to his aides, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And he recognized that the CIA had devolved from, a, from an agency that is supposed to protect America's national security to its primary function, providing a constant pipeline of new wars and then the propaganda, the comic book propaganda that says this guy's evil and we're good and, you know, we're going... Wait, wait, so, so, but, but you're saying Putin is not evil? Well, I'm saying that Putin did not want the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war is, uh, you know, is a war. And we, you know, we, you listen, Putin repeatedly, for, first of all, 
it's not just Putin, it's the entire Russian leadership was horrified about the idea of NATO going into Ukraine, just as we wouldn't allow you know, Russia to put bases in Mexico or Canada. And then, you know, we uh, let me just tell you kind of the lead up, what happened in the lead up of the Ukraine war. It, the Ukraine war, we were lied to because we're told, oh yeah, this evil Putin trying to take over Europe and this is his first step to reestablishing the, the Soviet empire. And that, you know, it, it's the same kind of- And is that a lie? Yeah, it's the same comic book description we were given of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, which we were just lied into a war. And yeah, it was a slam dunk that he had weapons of mass destruction. Of course he didn't. And he had nothing to do with terrorism. And he was running the most progressive uh, nation in the Mid-East. It was a secularized nation. It wasn't a, th a, a theocracy. He wouldn't let people... Um, you know, Saddam Hussein, I will agree that you know maybe right, in well, hindsight that was that was a mistake. But all right, Putin, then, then let me let me tell you what happened. The real story behind what happened in Ukraine, and and let, let me go back to 1992 because 1992 the walls come down, the Berlin Wall Berlin comes Wall. down, and Gorbachev does something very courageous. He goes to Tony Blair and George Bush. And he says, I'm going to allow you to do something that nobody in their right mind would do, which is I'm going to remove 450,000 Russian troops from East Germany, and I'm going to allow you to unify East Germany under NATO, which is a hostile army. But I want one commitment to you, from you. You will never move NATO further to the east. James Baker, who was then Secretary of State, famously said to him, we will not move NATO one inch to the east. So then, five years later, 1997, the big new Brzezinski, who was the first of the neocons, comes along and proposes, let's move NATO to right up to the Russian borders. We're into 15 nations, okay? And at that time, the, the most important diplomats in American history at that time were George Kennan, who was the, the architect of the containment policy during the Cold War. He said, if you do that, you're gonna force, you're, this is crazy, it's insane. Russia just lost the Cold War. We should be giving them a Marshall Plan and integrating them into the, the civilized society, the Western society. Don't make them an enemy. Don't treat them like they're still an enemy. It's gonna, this is gonna force a, a, a violent military response from Russia if you do that. Bill Pierce, who was then the Secretary of, of Defense, threatened Clinton that he would resign if they went ahead with this plan because it was so reckless. And Bill Perry, and Bill Pierce is now the head of the CIA. Bill Perry, who was the US ambassador to Russia at the time, said the same thing. Why are you doing this? This is crazy. So between now and then, we move NATO into 14 countries. Why do we move NATO in? Because when, they, when you move them into a new country, they have to sign a contract that conforms all their weapons purchases to NATO specifications, which means you have to buy the weapons from Northrop Grumman, you know, from our, these big US military contractors who profit from war. So we're, we move it there. We're, in the meantime, we walk away unilaterally from two nuclear weapons treaties with Russia. Russia wants those treaties. They're intermediate range missile systems that, you know, so that, which destabilized Europe when we, when we remove our agreement not to fire missiles on Russia. And we put Aegis missile systems, which are nuclear capable, in Romania and Poland. So, but so the broad, broad, listen, you know the details and these yeah. details, are, but, and, and, and I'm not taking a side on this, but, if there was any, which a lot of people aren't really advocates of, but it, Trump, if anything, kind of, and whether he was a puppet or not, whatever you believe, he kind of normalized the Russian relationship, kind of, right? By becoming somewhat of a, a friend of Putin's. So between that time and the time that Putin, there was no NATO movement between the time after the Trump administration. Yeah, well, what we did is, and we overthrew the government of Ukraine. So no, he, he came into Ukraine before 
We threw overthrew the government in 2014. USAID, which has spent $5 billion, which is a front for the CIA, which everybody acknowledges, went in there and started a revolution called the, it's called the Maidan Rebellion, where there was these protests that ended with the overthrow of the elected government of Ukraine that wanted to keep Ukraine neutral. Yakonovich wanted to keep NATO neutral. We wanted a pro-U.S. government. So we went in there in 2014, overthrew their government, and placed a, a government. And by the way, a month before the overthrow, we now have tapes that you can go on the internet and listen to. A Victoria Newland, who's the, who's the head of the neocons now, the deputy director of the State Department, uh, choosing the new Ukrainian cabinet that will be put in place after the coup that was still a month away. So she knew the coup was coming a month in advance. And but who is she to us? She's us. She's the head of the State Department. She's now, you know, number three in the State Department. But she's been in the State Department. She's one of the, you know, she's a ne- she's the she runs the neocon uh, uh, program, which is you know continual wars. So she goes. She they we then. Pick a new government. The new government comes in, immediately begins attacking the the people of Donbass and Lugansk, who are Russian-speaking ethnic Russians. They ban the Russian language, which was there was two languages that were two official languages. Ukraine they ban that. Their violence immediately erupts, and they kill fourteen. There's a civil war. It really this war started in 2014. There's. 14,000 ethnic Russians are killed. And and Putin kept saying, you're killing our people. He's trying to get a peace agreement. They finally work out a peace agreement called the Minsk Accords. Germany signs onto it. France signs onto it. England signs onto it. And Russians sign onto it. Zelensky runs in 2019 as president. He runs, he has one platform issue. He's a comedian and an actor, which I'm not- Is there anything wrong with that? Oh, my (laughs) wife is is one of those. Okay, all right. But he never had any political experience. Right. And he wins with 70% of the vote. Why? Because he runs on a peace platform. I'm going to sign the Minsk Accords. As soon as he gets in there, Victoria Newland and the, the, you know, ultra-nationalists, which is a nice way of describing the, you know, the people who run that government now, um, tell him that he can't do it. He can't sign it. So he pivots. And then um, and, and uh, Putin then says, okay, Putin is now faced with this problem. The United States government is now running the government of Ukraine. And he is frightened to death that the U.S. Navy is going to go into Vladivostok, which is, you know, the southern port. It's been the Russian port. It's only warm water port Russia has for 347 years. So he then goes right into Ukraine because he's got, I mean, into Crimea and takes Crimea without firing a shot. Doesn't kill a single person because the people of Crimea are ethnic Russian and want him back, want him in there. Donbass and Lugansk then votes 90, 90 to 1, 90 to 10 to join Russia. Putin says, no, I don't want you. I want Ukraine to be a functioning state. But let's sign the Minsk Accords. And, um, and they won't sign it. So then he, sign, he sends in 40,000 troops. I'm almost done with okay. this. He sends in 40,000 troops. That, that is not a somebody who wants to conquer Ukraine. There's, it's a nation of 44 million people. All he wanted was us back at the negotiating table. Um, Zelensky, we will not help Zelensky negotiate. So he goes to Israel and gets Naftali Bennett and Erdogan in Turkey to sponsor negotiations. And they go and they work out a peace agreement. And Putin, they sign it in April of 2022. Putin is withdrawing his troops according to this peace agreement. Already starts withdrawing them. Biden sends over Tony Blair and tells Zelensky to rip up the peace agreement. Now, how do we know this? Because all of the negotiators are now talking, including Naftali Bennett. And you can look it up when you're on the internet. You say you spend a lot of time. I do. Look at his speech where he tells you what happened. The lead Ukrainian negotiator this week 
came clean and said, yeah, that's what happened. Oh, so, you know, of so, course, Russia, Russia's been invaded three times through Ukraine. The last time. So is Russia the good guy in your <laughs> no, mind? No, so. Russia, it was illegal what Russia did. But we have to understand they, they don't want the, this war. We wanted the war. So let me ask you, I'm not a history buff. I don't know anything about what you're saying. I haven't learned any of this or looked any of it up. But I do want to know, now that you're saying this, what would you do moving forward with this war if you were to be elected? Like, what's I, your I would salt? negotiate an end to the war. My son fought over there, incidentally. You know, my son left. He didn't tell us where he was going. He and I argued about the war from the very beginning. He's 28 years old. He went over there. He joined a special forces unit, and he fought in the Kharkiv offensive. He started out as a drone operator, which is the most the, the most dangerous position because as soon as you turn on the drone, the right, it's no, it was an artillery war pretty much, and the Russians couldn't know where you were. You have a radio. That's a radio signal to operate a drone, so that's the, the, you're, exactly. you're, you become a target. And then he uh, and then he became a machine gun uh, machine gunner for the unit. And he fought in the you know night actions throughout the Kharkiv offensive, and so you know, thank God he's home right now. So, but since then, almost five hundred thousand Ukrainians have died. So here's my my question, and it goes back to the and very none first of them question. Needed to die. So you don't agree with the policy? You don't agree with the, our foreign policy and the way it's no. being handled? Um, in order to do to have any movement in change, it, you know, whether somebody agrees with you or doesn't agree with you or negates something that you're saying, you would have to be the president. To make a decision to run as an independent, I mean, history kind of proves itself. How, can't you, how, you can't win. You can't win. Well, I know that you're you're now trying to make it so that your name is on the ballot in every state, right? That's like what yeah. your goal is now because in the past it's been very difficult for someone who's running as an independent to even make it that far. Yeah, I mean, I'm in better shape than any independent in 100 years. So but than any time. independent, have we ever elected an independent? Well, well George Washington was elected as independent. So um, we have a great counts. track record. Yeah, that counts. <laughs> yeah of, of course not. But, you know, we're not, we're at a different time in history right now. And my numbers are better than any independent who's ever run. Right, but isn't it, if you, if you legitimately, you're a smart person, if you legitimately want to win, do you legitimately want to win or... Are you looking to damage one of the sides? No, to of course not. I'm, I'm, I'm running to win. And if I had to put money on it, I would put money on myself. How, how is that just knowing, just knowing the... Uh, listen, you're, 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 you've been involved, your family has been involved in politics your entire life and you're, you're uh, you know, royalty as far as, uh, you know, politics goes you understand media and that and 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 it just doesn't we don't do that we i was born in canada but but uh, <laughs> america america just doesn't do that they're well, very tribal you, there, there's there's new things being done every day and let me just i tell you this that i'm already winning i'm beating both president Trump, biden and president trump and people under 45 years old. I'm beating them, and I'm beating them by a landslide in people under 35. I'm beating them in the largest cohort, which is the independents. People are unaffiliated. I win that cohort. I am- I, Why is that the largest cohort? Because I well, think there are- for the, no, the, for the first time in history, the first election in history, independents out, uh, out, uh, out are, are are larger, are more numerous than either Democrats or Republicans. This is the first time in history. It's in registered like voting? Yeah, registered voting. There are more regis registered are independents. More people who, are de who declare themselves are self-declared independents. But registered. But what they call them now in the polls unaffiliated voters, but who say, I'm not a Democrat and I'm not a Republican. They are now the voters' largest voting bloc. And I am, I beat Trump and Biden among independents. I beat Trump and Biden among people under 35. I'm in a three way tie with Hispanic voters. I beat them decisively in landslide among women who have children under 18 years of age. 
the only cohort where I don't do very, very well is uh, baby boomers. Now, that's the cohort that you would expect would support me the most because they're the ones that remember Camelot. And that's what you are. <laughs> but they don't like me because they, want, they get their news from TV. And people who get their news from TV are going to have a very low opinion of me. And because the television networks are, you know, uniformly against me, they get their... Uh, but not only TV, you know, your, um, your perceived stances on things have been very, very controversial. And even off, off of TV, on social media, as you just opened up this discussion with, you were, you were banned. Are you an anti-vaxxer? Well, I was banned because the government told Instagram to ban me. Are you, are you an anti-vaxxer? No, I'm not, I'm not anti-vaccine. You're not an anti-vaxxer? No, I'm not anti-vaccine. If you show me a vaccine that was safe and effective, that did what it was supposed to do, well, I would have no problem with it. I'm talking about general vaccines. Which vaccine? Measles. Measles? Would I take a measles vaccine? No. Are your kids vaccinated? Yeah, all my kids are fully vaccinated, and I'm fully vaccinated. I mean, I didn't take the COVID vaccine. But, you know, I, I was full, I, you know, I, my whole life, I was taking the flu shot every year. Right. You um, won't do that anymore? No, I would not do that because I've read the science now. But reading the science, not being a scientist, do you really have, do we have? I, I read science for a living. And I, you know, I, I deconstruct scientists for a living. So I, ever, I know you've worked on it. You're like the Aaron Brockovich and that's the name that no, I know, but. I, I, I mean, I, I litigate against big polluters. I litigate against pharmaceutical companies. And I've brought over 500 lawsuits. Every one of them virtually involves a scientific controversy. Every one of them has a battle of experts. And my job is to understand the science and deconstruct it for the jury and explain it to them. So, so the, if you... If you don't think highly of these vaccines and you don't think they're safe and you think well, they what, do more I, harm I, than... I, here's what I would say about vaccines, okay? okay. The, the problem that I have with vaccines, I mm -hmm. think, is a problem that every American would have if they knew the truth, which is this, that vaccines are the only medical product that's, that are exempt from pre-licensure Safe, safety testing. So but they're not what, safety testing. But what, do you mean what are you by talking about? Even the COVID thing had to pass. COVID is the yeah. first one that ever had a safety test, a mandated and, vaccine. And you didn't take it. <laughs> I didn't take it because I read the safety study and the, the Pfizer study showed that there, there were more deaths in the placebo group, 23% more deaths of all causes and than there were in the vaccine group. I, 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 excuse me, the other way around. There were 23% more among vaccinated people than there were among unvaccinated. They were looking at 22,000 vaccinated, 22,000 unvaccinated. Can I, can I give you an, a, a, a possible argument to that? Yeah. The, the majority of people when the, when the, when the vaccine started were, uh, because we were taught, and I'm not science, I don't know anything about science. I don't even have a GED, so I'm, it's interesting that and I, I don't feel equipped to have this conversation, but the truth of the matter is they were told there, were, there was an at-risk population and that at-risk at population was over 60, overweight, and uh, so they were, they were aged out and overweight. So the majority of people that originally got the vaccine were older, unhealthy, overweight people. So it would, it would make sense that there would be 23 percent more of the vaccinated people dying of all causes, not specifically and not attributed directly to the vaccine, but because of who they were and what kind of shape they were in. And you see what you just said shows that you can understand science and that you can understand where certain studies would be flawed or where, where there would be a bias incorporated. And that's a very, very good point what you just made and it shows that yeah you can you don't have to be a scientist to read science you don't have to be a lawyer to read law you can un, you know we all have brains right? but it, but even when it, wait, but, but go, let go. me just let me okay. Uh, okay. tell you why why the, the bias that you just described is was not a factor here because you were not looking at the people who first took the vaccine you were looking at the clinical trial group which the company 
um, has to to has to have a cross section of the American public. Oh, there were kids in the group. There were old people. There were everybody. It wasn't people who just said, you know, oh, I'm first in line for the vaccine because I'm old. This is the clinical trial study. A clinical trial study, you had 22,000 people who took the vaccine right. and 22,000 people who got the placebo. And what if the result was after six months, they had to hand that data to FDA in order to get the emergency use authorization. What that data showed that in the vaccine group, there was one COVID death of 22,000 people over six months. Right. In the, COVID, in the unvaccinated group, there were two COVID deaths. So of 22,000 people. So that allowed the company to tell the public the vaccine is 100% effective. Because- 100%, but that's a, that's a misnomer. 100% effective in as far as, because I saw people on the news going, well, I got the vaccine and I still got COVID. They never said you won't get COVID. They just said that the it'll uh, kind of uh, pull back the severity of it. So the fact is that's well proven. You had okay, double the deaths but, 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 without but, but, but it. But Howie, right. listen to this, okay. Okay. If this makes any sense to you, they say what they're saying out of 22,000 people, there was one COVID death among the vaccinated and there was two COVID deaths on the unvaccinated. Double. 22,000 people. So, and that that allowed them to claim it's 100% effective. Effective for what? You can't no, just use no, the word effective. They, no, but you remember they kept saying it's 100% effective. No, they just said it, it'll I, negate I can the play, severity. If you go on the internet, you can see Tony Fauci. But the word effective didn't say you won't get, I never oh, heard no. you won't get COVID. Oh yeah, well, this is a different subject. But yeah, in fact, I saw a tape yesterday of them all, of Biden, Fauci, Gates, uh, you know, Burla, all of them saying, if you take the vaccine, Rachel Maddow, if you take the vaccine, you can't get COVID, you can't prep past COVID. I didn't see that. Okay, well, you know what? Can I play it for you? Yeah. All right. Well, 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 wait, you know, wait, wait, here. It doesn't matter what Rachel okay, Maddow says. But, but, right. Go. Well, let, let me just finish what I'm saying. Okay. okay. I just finished this point. It, it, it's not 100% effective, okay? Because if you, if that, that's the metric, what they really should have been telling us is that to prevent one COVID death, they need to give 22,000 vaccines. Now, well, that's a spin. <laughs> but that, that is the way they're supposed to report it. It's called number needed to vaccinate. No. Oh yeah, it's called NNTV and it is supposed, legally they need to report that in every study. Well, am I not saying the exact same thing as you in, in, in when I say that if you take the vaccine, but, if you take the vaccine, you will have half the deaths. Am that, I not well, saying you the can, same thing? You, yeah, you, that, that's what they're essentially saying. But, that's what I'm saying. Right. Okay, but half the deaths from COVID, okay? And what most scientists would say is that number is too small to make that determination. Half? It's one in two. It's well, There's only one vaccine death, one COVID death, and two in the other cohort. You know, that could have been because the one guy's fatter in that cohort or whatever. But would... But let me, so it's not statistically significant. You need four, you, they should have had 440,000. Listen, 000. I come I come from television. But, and but, but, we are, we, are, just, we spin just, all the time. We'll go, it's the right. number one show on Saturday right. nights for women over 54. Yeah, you're spinning you're, the numbers. You're playing with people's lives here. So you're, you're supposed to tell the truth. And what the truth is, you need mm. 22,000, you need to administer 22,000 vaccines to prevent one COVID death. Now, if you if that is your if that is your calculation, you better make sure the vaccine isn't killing anybody. And what they found when they looked at all cause deaths is they found that if you um, that in the vaccine group, in the unvaccinated group, there was one death of of cardiac arrest. Right. In the vaccinated group or five deaths. So what that means is your chance of getting a fatal cardiac arrest. With no six, connection whatsoever to the shit. Well, but how do you know the COVID had any connection? How do you know? I don't, of course you don't, you can't prove it, but what if you're gonna, if you're gonna give a license on the basis that one COVID death is, is prevented among every 22,000 people, and that, that's the data you're using. Well, the same data set is, yeah, you're gonna save one life from COVID, but you're gonna kill five people from heart attacks. 
Okay. If you, you assume, but but heart disease and heart attacks is the number assume, one killer in, in America. Uh, People are dropping dead every day without without yeah, a, a but vaccine. Do you understand what I'm saying? In the vaccinated group, there were five times the heart attacks as the unvaccinated. Oh, if you're going to say, well, you know, because in the vaccinated group there was one less COVID death, shouldn't I be able to point out? Yeah, but there were five more, five hundred percent more heart attacks. And it's the same. It's the same data set. They're trying to sell us on the vaccine because it's okay. It's so let's. I, okay, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah. No, I don't want to sell on the COVID vaccine. I think the COVID vaccine is a moot point, and it, you kind of gained popularity with your vaccine outlook when COVID hit. But you had this outlook previously on vaccines in general, and you had just said just now that they don't have any pre-licensing testing safety. Yeah. What does that mean? Because the FDA does require three-phase testing in order for a vaccine to be passed. So it does have, the FDA requires it, three-phase testing. So what is the pre-licensing that you're talking about? The FDA requires that prior to the license, you have phase one, phase two, and phase three efficacy testing. Right. They don't require safety testing. And the reason for that is because... What's the difference between efficacy and, and safety? Just. Efficacy, and it's just what we were talking about. If the vaccine saves you from measles, right. but you're 500% more likely to get cancer if you take that vaccine, is that safe and effective? It's, it's effective against measles, but it's not safe. If the vaccine is going to save you from COVID, but it raise your heart attack rate by 500%, it is effective against COVID, but it's not safe. So, so but they have those three phases, phases to make sure it does protect you about something that's imminently dangerous. Well, Going maybe, be, I mean, is hepatitis B imminently dangerous to the millions of babies who get it at birth? I don't think so. You only get it from sexual contact or sharing needles. But if we didn't have a vaccine for the measles and hepatitis and croup and all those, those or polio. when I was a kid, we didn't. And you yeah, know, the, you did. I did. I'm, had, I'm, were you and I are the same I'm, age? So I'm 69. I'm 68. You had right. four well, vaccines, they, they, right? They I took polio. I took the okay, measles. Well, that's, the the measles part. vaccine was introduced in '64. We had our generation, we had polio. You know, I and got me, you're, you're telling me pox. you did not get measles? No, I got the measles, I had, but then yeah. I had shots. As they came out, I had shots because millions of people were getting incredibly sick and dying. And that's the, not true. That's not true. No, that is not true. There were, at the beginning of the century, they had 10,000 measles deaths a year. But by the, um, by the time the measles vaccine was introduced, uh, that measles deaths had almost entirely disappeared. There, there are only a handful of deaths a year, and they were among people mainly who are malnourished, severely malnourished, which is why people were dying of measles in 1900, and why people in Africa die of measles. It's really malnutrition. Once you get a, a population that's, that is that is well nourished, that has good hygiene. Um, it's very hard to kill them with infectious disease. You know, it's very, very difficult to find a population that is healthy that is dying of infectious disease. Your uh, people you died four, from people died, vaccines to be people hit. died from COVID in this in country. The 50s. Were sick people. They were people. Uh, CDC said on average they had 3.8 chronic disease. So they had diabetes. They had obesity. They had you know asthma and something else. On average, it was only sick people who were dying wasn't well people it's very very and that's why we need to concentrate on public health well the truth of the matter is and this is how i i truly believe this i believe that a, a lot of mistakes were made but we were panicked and you know we made decisions based on the amount of information that we had at the moment and as we garnered more and more ed education you you were not you had never feared covid from day one me yeah I, I didn't fear COVID um, because I felt, I feel healthy. And, um, and I saw from the beginning that it was, you know, in, in Italy, we, we got data right away that the average age of death was 84. So, you know, we weren't being told that. We were, you know, we were watching the death count on CNN and all of the networks were drumming up fear and making us look at each other as biohazards and stuff. But, you know, I... 
um, I had seen these same actors before, and I also saw what they were doing, which was to violate all of the protocols that the public health agencies like WHO, the European Medical State, CDC, NIH, FDA, had built for years, which said you do not lock down a society when there's a respiratory, an infectious respiratory infection. It's going to spread. The worst thing you can do is lock them down because they amplify death. What we did in this country was we have the worst record of any country in the world. Uh, we had in America 16% of the COVID deaths, and we only have 4.2% of the global population. So we did something horribly, horribly wrong during COVID. We were told by Gates and Fauci at the beginning, Africa is going to get wiped out by COVID. Well, guess what? Africa didn't even know COVID existed. There were 14 deaths per million population in Nigeria, 14 deaths per million population in Haiti. We had 3,000 deaths per million population in blacks also, in this country. You don't so think that's we also had 200 times the death rates in, you know, in other countries. And the countries that were using ivermectin, were using hydroxychloroquine, were using therapeutic remedies, uh, and we were not allowed to use them. We were targeted vaccine only, lock yourself up in the play. And why would you lock a population down with a disease that does not spread outdoors? It only spreads indoors. So these were, you know, they because were- Because supposedly you were inside with people who didn't have it. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay now listen to what you're saying. Well, that was a, that was, uh, and, that and was what, a theory. Okay, and then let's say <laughs> grandma gets it. Right. She goes to the hospital and she gets a positive COVID test. She has a fever and she's coughing. What do they tell her at the hospital? I don't know. What did they, they tell her? They tell her, go home until your lips turn blue and you can't breathe. And then come back and we'll give you intubation and remdesivir, two things that will kill you. So she, they sent the people who were sick with COVID back to their homes to infect, to do super spreader events, to infect the whole family. They were locking us all up in our homes. Why would you ever do that? Why would you close? Why would you get surfers off the beach in Malibu and find them a thousand dollars and send them at home? It's not spreading out on the water. It wasn't spreading in the basketball courts. It was spreading in people's homes, and then they weren't treating people. It's the first time there's been a respiratory illness in history. If you go to a hospital with a the flu, they'll give you something, you know, to relieve your symptoms. They said no, nothing. Why were they doing that? Why? Here's why. Because there is a little known federal law that says that if there is an existing drug that has been approved for any purpose that is demonstrated effective against the target illness, it is illegal to grant an emergency use authorization for a vaccine for that disease. And that would have caused, why? if they had recognized because they know vaccines are dangerous. They know that you need 10 years of testing and, and emergency use authorization. As we're not gonna test it. We're just but, gonna give it to people. But let me, we, don't, we don't have 10 years. I, I know you guys keep bringing up COVID, but I'm focused on even other vaccines too that I know you've talked about. Sometimes you don't have 10 years. When it came to polio, they didn't have something else. They had a placebo that they gave them and then they gave the other group the vaccine and then they were rejoicing. They didn't have 10 years to see what the well, effects you know, of po the polio, polio vaccine listen, would polio have been. Polio is a complicated issue, okay? Mm -hmm. give, tell me another vaccine with it and have, you know, Polio, by the way, just appeared suddenly mm -hmm. in the 1950s. Polio had been around, the polio myocarditis virus had been around since the beginning of the time. Mm -hmm. They find it in ancient samples. It never killed anybody. It never paralyzed anybody. That's before. not true. The CDC says, it, CDC in pre-vaccine era, an estimated 2.7 million, million people. Yeah, that's in the 50s. And then, yes, That's in the, the 50s, 50s, before pre-vaccine. And during yeah, the study- I'm saying, but before the 50s, before the 40s, right. was, yeah. the, the polio really first appeared in around, you know, in, in agricultural oh, areas. You're closer to you. In agricultural areas mm -hmm. in the early 1900s. But then it became like in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it became a springtime illness. Mm -hmm. It usually affected people who had been swimming in agricultural ponds. And but that virus had been around forever and it never caused polio and people never caused you know, it caused a mild illness like a, a cold, mm -hmm. which it still does in most people. Well, I know I, personally, uh, as somebody as a child of the 50s, I know three or four people that I'm related to that got it and yeah, got yeah. it badly. And, and during just, the 50s, it was huge. Dis why, disfigurement. Why, you know, why was that true? Why? 
They weren't swimming in ponds. It, yeah, I, in the vaccine well, study, can I just finish? In the vaccine study, they knew it was affected because 16 of the children died in the study, and those were the ones that were given the placebo. And in that group, we knew that 34 of the 36 children were paralyzed, and those were the ones that were given the placebo, and none of them that were given the vaccine died or were well, paralyzed. That's true. Look up Cutter incident. Look up Cutter incident. Okay. That was the I mean, this is test. based on CDC. Look at, right. Look up Cutter incident. Okay. C U T T. And I. T T E R. And what does it say? Well, we're getting to it. I don't know what the Cutter incident is. What Cutter incident? Polio. And it will come up. You mm. there? Mm hmm. What does it say? In April 1955, more than 200,000 children in five Western and Midwestern USA states received a polio vaccine in which the process of inactivating the live virus proved to be defective. Within days, there were reports of paralysis and within a month, but, the, but that completely contradicts what the study that the CDC said and that only- This was the CDC study. That's the CDC's own study, the Cutter study. Published where? JRSM, it's what's published that? published everywhere. I mean, everybody knows about that Cutter incident. We didn't. Journal of the Royal <laughs> Society oh, yeah, of Medicine, the yeah. Cutter incident, reviewed by Michael Fitzpatrick. You can find it. You can find hundreds and hundreds, probably a thousand articles on the Cutter incident. Well, yeah, I could find a hundred and thousands of articles but, 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 that the world is nobody, flat. Nobody is denying that the Cutter incident took place where they, you know, they gave the vaccine and the kids who got the vaccine actually got the polio and got paralyzed. So do you think uh, the vaccine they, is still no, connected I, to I, autism? Here was, that, not the polio vaccine. Not the polio, but just general. Yeah, vaccines are definitely linked to autism. Sure. I, I have read studies that maybe I'm not yeah, qualified to understand that they're not. That's been yeah, debunked. And you can find about 16 studies that say we could not find their epidemiological studies where they say we could not find a, um, a signal. But then you can find CDC's own data that show, you know, they did a study in 1999 called the Virginia Stratton study um, where their initial data run showed a 1135% elevated risk for autism among kids who got the hepatitis B vaccine in their first 30 days of life compared to kids who got it later or didn't get it at all. So that's a, that's a, that's called a relative risk of 11.35. The relative risk of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years and getting lung cancer is 10. A CDC knew at that moment what was causing the autism epidemic. And I'm not saying all autism is caused by vaccines. I'm saying that the vaccines definitely, um, you know, are, are largely responsible for the epidemic that we saw begin in 1989, where we went from one in 10,000, and you're my generation, today, one in 10,000. I bet you've never seen somebody with full-blown autism. And that, I don't mean your quirky uncle. Who's no, like, I know somebody with full-blown I mean, toe-walking, hand-flapping, non-toilet trained, wearing a helmet, head-banging, uh, stimming, uh, non-verbal. Right. So, you know, I, I have never met anybody 69 like that. And, and it's one in every 34 in my kids' generation. Oh, something happened, and when Congress said to EPA, tell us what year the autism epidemic began, EPA came back and said it's a red line, 1989. Something happened in 1989. So what happened in 1989? What's A different? lot of things happened that, that are probably linked to it. One is there are a number of toxins that were introduced in the 90s. One of those is glyphosate, which I've litigated on. Another one is, uh, which is in Roundup. Another one is, which became ubiquitous. You have to find a toxin that is ubiquitous. That impacted every demographic from Cubans in Key Biscayne to, uh, you know, to Inuit in, in Homer, Alaska. And, um, and that affects boys in neurological injuries at a four to one ratio as girls. So there's a number of, um, of uh, toxins that fit the time profile. One is Roundup and glyphosate. Another is PFOAs, which are the, what we call, people call forever chemicals. I litigated on those. My, uh, my lawsuit was subject to a movie, um, a, of a movie called Dark Water starring Mark Ruffalo. Um, atrazine, which is 63% of our water now nationwide. 
Um, neonicotinoid pesticides introduced around the same time. Uh, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, That's um, dangerous. Well, I. Wow. It, Are you high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> That's like a widely known thing that high fructose. Uh, corn I just, syrup I just love right. high fructose corn syrup. It That's is good. It. It's yummy. Oh, you're too old. To get any <laughs> back anyway, but young people should not be. Eating it if you're, you're going to drink a coke. So here's like so th this is like a, a, a kind of a, a full and then and then the vaccine schedule went from you know we with the three vaccines you and I got the seventy two mandated vaccines that you know our kids now get well and that's it, wait but seventy two is an extreme number that's mostly because you take stuff like Tdap or MMR or stuff like that and you're separating them into every single antigen that's in that vaccine and calculating that and then also calculating how often that vaccine is given yeah, that, and then calculating the flu vaccine that's also like it's yeah, that's of course an, of course that's, that's how an you, exaster, ex that, Exactly. No, that is the accurate way of describing what there, there are there are 72 antigens or 72 doses of 16 vaccines, 16 antigens. So there's 72 doses of 16 antigens. So when someone says they're getting a Tdap vaccine, yeah, you're, you're counting that as three. Yes, I'm counting that as three different vaccines, which it is. So, and if you look at those vaccines, all of the injuries that began appearing in 1989, it wasn't just autism, it was all these neurological injuries. You and I grew up at the same time. We didn't see any of this stuff when we were kids. No. ADD a little, but ADHD, speech delay, no. Language delay, tics, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism, we didn't even see it. All these allergic diseases began appearing on that same timeline. Peanut allergies, food allergies, uh, eczema, anaphylaxis, asthma, my, my brother had asthma. He was told by his doctor that there will never be a cure for asthma because it's so rare nobody will ever study it. And yet today, it's one out of every black kid has asthma. So what, what happens? Something happened. And then, you know, the, all these autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile diabetes. Uh, yeah, how many kids did you know in your elementary school that had carrying needles around, you know, or EpiPens? They, they just were not when we were kids. Kids were healthy. Peanuts weren't dangerous. Peanuts weren't dangerous. They are now. And, it, and, it, and the, the year was 1989 when that started happening. Something happened that year. And it has to be an environmental toxin because genes do not cause epidemic. And we in this country have the highest chronic disease burden in the world. So we went from 6% of kids had chronic disease when my uncle was president, and today about 60% do. What happened? Something has made our kids the sickest generation in history and the sickest kids in the world. But the antibodies in, in every single vaccine have actually gone down in the years than prior. We had 3,000 antibodies in the pertussis vaccine when we were taking the pertussis vaccine, and now it's only, I think, 30-something. Yeah, I, I, but I'm so not sure what So it's not point. really, to say that we have more and we have more vaccines, oh, well, we but also the lot. antibodies and antigens have gone well, down. I mean, but, listen, we went from three vaccines that your dad and I had. Which vaccines did you have? It was the polio, the typhus, uh, and the smallpox. Oh, smallpox, okay. yes. Oh, and then to the vaccines, the, the 72 doses of 16 vaccines that mm -hmm. our kids now, and now it's going up to 77 because they're going to do the COVID vaccines. And our kids, in order to go to school in this state and many other states, you have to get in order to go to school. And then, you know, and there's no exemptions. Mm -hmm. You can't get a medical exemption. You can't get a, you know, a religious exemption. Like every kid has to get it. And we never had any of this before. There were always exemptions. And you know, when I was a kid, there was, I mean, we didn't have, by the way, there were no great plagues of rotavirus and hepatitis B going around yes, among there children. Were. When Hold I was on, a I kid. have that too. In the pre vaccine area, era, that's what it said. The 2.7 million were rotavirus infections occurred every year in the United States and 95% of children experience at least one rotavirus infection by age five years. And, and rotavirus infection were responsible for 410,000 physician visits, more than 200,000 emergency department visits, and 55,000 to 70,000 hospitalizations, and 20 to 60 deaths annually, and then 
and children under age five. 20 to 60 deaths. Rotavirus accounted for 30% to 50% of all, all hospitalizations for gastroenteritis. Uh, and how many deaths? Among children 20, younger than 20 five. 20 deaths a year to 60 deaths. So you're giving. But it's not true to say we never had it. No, but That's I, like, it those are not, huge numbers. So it, we can't yeah, say never I'll tell had you what, it. Nobody in my generation even knew what rotavirus was. We knew what measles was because yeah. we, we saw it. Uh, 20 deaths a year. But is now that, you're only focusing wait, on the deaths. But, 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 yeah, yeah. It's, well, that's what I'm focusing on. But you said on. we never had it before. Oh, no, and I'm it just did saying cause a we didn't problems. have great plagues of it. Now, okay. look, 20 deaths. So now you're going to give 76 million kids a medical intervention, healthy kids, mm -hmm. on the day they're born, mm -hmm. a medical intervention that, may, that has a, a long Here, list of side effects. Again, that, from an ignorant point of view, and yeah. I, that's me. That's I, I. I'm the spokesperson for the ignorant. <laughs> I, I believe that with, without even knowing the science, I just remember that when you and I were kids, there was a different way of consuming and eating. And you know, there were even commercials like "You better eat your vegetables, or you're not getting dessert." And it just so happens that that next generation, you know, you're eating, you're drinking blue soda. You're eating, everything has so many more preservatives and we're eating so much more crap and corn syrup that, you know, to blame it on the uh, vaccines rather than our, I'm not, our I'm consumption. Not, okay, but Howie, I'm not blaming it on the vaccines. I'm just, I'm saying that the vaccines are part of it. Yeah. But all of the, our kids are today are swimming around in a toxic soup and we have a health, public health agency NIH, that used to be the premier public health agency in the world. It has a budget of $42 billion a year. It distributes that money to 56,000 scientists in research institutions and universities. We're supposed to be doing research to protect public health. Why is nobody doing research to figure out what is causing these uh, this epidemic, we went, this, this Are you disease. saying there's no research right now I, happening? I, I, I'm saying that if you d try to do that research, you're gonna get career punishment for doing it. And that the NIH will not fund it. What they will fund is they will incubate, they will fund research on drugs to treat food allergies. They'll fund research on drugs to treat asthma, but they will not look at what is causing it. And that data is out there. And I'll, I'll tell you something. The, 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 all of these things are, are probably acting synergistically and accumulatively to disable our kids. But vaccines are part of it. And it, there, was, uh, there was a series of studies done in 1999 by CDC itself to try to explain the, these exploding autism rates. They brought in a Belgium scientist and they found this huge signal that said, yeah, it's the vaccines. So what did they do? They, they, they were studying a database called the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which is the biggest database for public health information. It's, the it's all the data from the top 10 HMOs. So what that, that database has, every shot that every, got, every one of the customers of that HMO ever got, and it has all their subsequent medical claims. So you could actually do with AI very easily a cluster analysis and say, which of these, are these interventions associated with later medical claims like EpiPens or insulin syringes or something that the HMO has to pay for? And you could narrow it down and say, oh, it's the DTaP vaccine or the Pertuzzi vaccine given within the first two weeks that does it. And if it's after two weeks, it, it's fine. Those are the studies we need to do. Oh, and but what did CDC do when it found this huge signal um, in 1999? It shut down that database. Why? Will, what, what's the motive? Because they don't want people, they don't want anybody doing research that is going to expose the, uh, the problems in the vaccine program. At, at why? why? Is it, uh, well, because it's a, an amazing they're, industry? They're, they're, it, it, ultimately, it's because of agency capture, because the agency is no longer protecting public health. The agency functions to promote the mercantile ambitions of the pharmaceutical industry. And, and there are a number of, um, of uh, mechanisms that put agency capture in those public health agencies on steroids. And I'll, I'll just tell you one of them. FDA gets 50% of its budget from pharmaceutical companies. So that would be like, you know, 
Yeah. EPA is a captive agency. It's a conflict of interest. I've sued EPA so many times, I can't even count them. But if EPA was getting half of its, of its, of its budget from coal industry and it was dependent on coal profits for that budget, you'd see a level of agency capture that is, you know, we, we couldn't even calculate, but that's what is happening at FDA. Then, you know, NIH, if you're a scientist at an NIH, and you work on a product that then becomes a pharmaceutical drug, you get to keep royalties on that product for $150,000 a year. And, and NIH can keep 50% of the royalties. So I'll give you an example. The Moderna vaccine was owned by NIH, and then it was farmed out to Moderna. But 50% of it is owned, and NIH gets 50% of the profits. When you say NIH gets the profits, a sp specific people at the NIH? Who? Here, there's two things that happen. One is the NIH itself, the agency, gets to um, claim it has margin rights for fifty percent of the royalties. So is that do you can is that a public? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can look that up. It's called the uh, Dole Buy or the Buy Dole Act, and and it was passed, I think, in eighty or eighty four. But um, the other thing that it allows is that individuals in that agency who worked on that product on Moderna, there are six individuals at NIH who are collecting $150,000 a year for as long as mRNA vaccines are But on. what about the Pfizer? Moderna did the, that, that was the competitor. Well, fi Pfizer and Moderna are suing each other because F Moderna says the mRNA uh, you know, platform that is being but NIH, but the N uh, the NIH didn't it, it no NIH developed it at Moderna and then Moderna passed on the technology to Pfizer. So you know, Moderna now has a claim against Pfizer's profits and they're litigating that. Last I heard, they were litigating. So it. knowing so, your oh, go ahead, you have a question. So knowing that you, uh, I mean, you say you're not anti-vax, but it seems like you have a lot of problems with vaccines, at least the way they are currently and how they've been in the past. So what what would you do? Is this part of your platform? Are you looking to do something? Well, I, you know, I don't talk a lot about vaccines on my platform. You guys wanted to talk about oh, it, so sorry. I'm talking about it. <laughs> no, but here's, here's what I, here's what I, you know, I know you don't. And, yeah. but, but, but here's the, uh, another thing that I've noticed from the outside. You have been able to manipulate great change a lot of it for good, environment. I like the word manipulate, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't know that you're manipulating it, but you Maybe know, with orchestrate, it, orchestrate, <laughs> get paid for, and stop uh, certain kind of behaviors when it comes to polluting water and yeah. uh, and pipelines, and for the uh, uh, native, uh, you know, the uh, uh, even up in my country, I think you were working in Quebec and Alberta, yeah, and lots. Uh, yeah, you did and, things for uh, the Vancouver Island. Yeah, and, and for the food industry and and Manitoba. in Manitoba, everywhere around the yeah. world, you have been able to make changes uh, based on your uh, you know the, your ability to litigate and then bring to public attention and then to change policy. It seems like what you've been doing your whole life is much. It's a much easier mechanism to make these changes and make the world better than in the Oval Office. You know, I just think that when you're the president, it's such a big cluster. Fuck. You know, how do you well, get things done? Because I think that's one of the reasons I think that I'm going to be more effective than anybody else who's running. And I don't want to say that in a you know a vain way, but. I've litigated. You have to deal with Senate, Congress. I, I, yeah. Yeah, well, not uh, not all the, not for the most important things that I need to do. I don't need to go to the Senate and Congress. I can fix the agencies myself. I can get them. You know, and I. You can't dismantle an agency alone. Yeah, Unilaterally. Yeah. Well, and uh, dismantle it is not what I would do. What would you do? I would redirect it. So my first week in office, I'm going to go to Bethesda, to NIH, and I'm going to say, we're going to, we're going to find out what is causing the chronic disease epidemic. Why did asthma explode? Why did food allergies explode? Why did all those autoimmune diseases? We're going to do that science right now, and then we're going to do real science on all the vaccines. So we're going to look at unvaccinated and vaccinated cohorts, and we're going to look at the level of chronic disease in them. And then we're going to look at blue 
Gatorade like you just brought up and right. see if the people who drink red Gatorade are better off than the rats. We're going to get blue Gatorade to rats and red Gatorade, and we're going to actually do the science on all these food products that, and all these other products that NIH will not do today because NIH operates at the bidding of the food industry. So the if that's true, why are they going to listen to the president? Well, because I'm their boss. I fire people. I know how to fix these agencies. When you sue these agencies, you get a PhD in how to unravel them. I know the individuals in a lot of these agencies that are causing the problem. I'm, I've sued, I've sued, I've sued uh, NIH, CDC, FDA, EPA, FCC. I just won in the Court of Appeals against the FCC for lying to the public about cell phone radiation and you know and the dangers of that. I've sued, I'm right now involved in litigation. I'm representing a thousand families in East Palestine, Ohio, whose lives were upended by the Norfolk Southern spill. And that's all because of agency capture at DOT. That spill happened because of agency capture. It is a direct negligence by the DOT. I know how to fix these things. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna fix them overnight. I wanna ask you something that's really important, I think, to a lot of the uh, public that has to do with the housing crisis and the middle class kind of just disintegrating. What's your plan for that if you're in office? I, you know, I have an extensive plan for um, how to get this generation of kids into housing. And, you know, I'm, this is one of my principal preoccupations that I have seven kids and, uh, and one of them, the eldest who's 39 is in a house, but the other, the six younger ones, between 20 and, you know, and 30, none of them has any prayer of getting into a home. And the housing prices have gone up um, by, uh, from $215,000 to two years ago to 400,000 today. The interest rates have gone up from 3% to almost 8%, which means my kids are paying 10 or 11%. And they're competing against BlackRock State and, and its company, Blackstone. BlackRock doesn't actually buy single family homes, but these giant behemoths, Blackstone, BlackRock, uh, State Street, Vanguard, Fidelity are, are now buying single family. They own a, You, you can't companies. dismantle them. Uh, no, you can't. Uh, but there's things that you can do. And I'll, I, I'm happy to talk about that. They okay. own 89% of the S&P 500. Okay. And now they're trying to buy all of our farmland and they're trying to buy um, all of our uh, our single family homes. So and, what can you do? Is that considered oh, a monopoly? Is that like a monopoly? No, it, it, in some, BlackRock is not a monopoly, but it has companies within certain sectors that are operating monopolistically. And in those cases, I will bring Sherman Antitrust Act actions against them. Um, I'll do, the, on the longer term, I'll do, I'll fix the IRS, which I need the Senate and House to do, and I'll, um, and I'll, I'll I'm going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to offer a law that will penalize large companies, large investment firms from owning multiple units of single family housing. So it will no longer be profitable. And that will release a tremendous amount of housing back into the marketplace. So our kid, right now, our kids are competing against Black, BlackRock's bank book. So, you know, our, my kid right. has a crappy credit rating. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue a new class immediately, a new class of T-bill, treasury bills at 3% interest to people who are buying single family homes, particularly young people and teachers. And I'm going to, um, and, uh, and I'm going to fund that by issuing these treasury bill. I'm going to issue mortgages at 3%. I'm going to fund that with treasury bills that are, are 3% treasury bills, um, but they are tax free. So the, mm -hmm. the company, it will be funded by the market. And you know, if you have a rich uncle um, who will co-sign your mortgage, you can get a much better rate because the bank is basing their interest rate not on your lousy credit rating, but on your uncle's fantastic credit rating. And I'm gonna give everybody a rich uncle, all these young people, which is Uncle Sam, which is gonna guarantee your mortgage so to allow you to get that 3% rate. And if you default on it, you know, the, we will inherit, the federal government will inherit, this is how Freddie Mac with Fannie Mae, operated and they now have 110 billion dollar surplus from the homes that they reclaimed 
My uncle did a very, very similar um, uh, legislation in, uh, in 1961. And this week I was in Orlando or in Tampa um, visiting one of the uh, apartment units. There's, uh, I think there's 183 apartment units. The, the, the rent for those units is about $250 a month. And I was at 3% interest. It was one of the, you know, and I'm going to do that. I mean, my primary objective other than ending the forever wars and ending the chronic disease epidemic is to get this generation of kids into houses. What's your tax policy? I'm not going to raise taxes, but I'll probably move them around. But I'm not going to raise the, you know, the tax totals. So uh, let's talk about your opponents. Who's more dangerous? What, what, what are your thoughts on Trump and Biden? I Tell don't, me why we shouldn't. I don't well, talk about, you know, I don't talk about them as being dangerous. I, you know, and I don't. Well, why is it bad for America? Why are you better for America? Well, I, than, you know what? Than, I, yeah, that's what I prefer to talk about. And I, you know, I think um, they, uh, I, I mean, you know, one, one of the things that I fault, I talked about Trump's policies, but not about his personal issues. So let's talk about his policies. Well, you know, I, I'll give you an example of, of things that his own followers and I like is the lockdowns. He, he locked down three, he shut down without 3.3 million businesses in this country with no due process, no just compensation, no public hearings, no notice and comment rulemaking, all the things I've been suing government for doing for years, you know, of letting, of, of wielding power without democratic process. He shut down all these businesses. He he put a lot of the business will never reopen. Forty-one percent of black-owned businesses that closed during COVID will never reopen. They're permanently bankrupt. A lot of them had three generations of equity in them, of you know, of people working to put that business together. They were beneficial to those communities. He shifted turf by doing that. He shifted four trillion dollars from the American middle class to this to this new generation, this new oligarchy of billionaires. We create in in five hundred days, Biden and Trump created a billionaire a day, 500 new billionaires in 500 days. How did Biden do that? This, by, by, by continuing the lockdowns. Uh, abortion. Abortion is a, is a woman's choice. You know, I, look, I've been the premier leader in this country for many, many years fighting for medical freedom, for autonomy, that people should have autonomy over their own bodies. And, you know, I, I'm not happy about abortions. I think they're, everyone is a tragedy, but I think that, you know, the government can't be the arbiter that we have to trust women. And, you know, ultimately it's up to, it's gotta be up to a woman to make that choice. Well, and, as far I, as giving it to the states or do you think it's a federal, uh, would you release, you would know, you I return women, to I, Roe I versus think, I think women should have that right wherever they live. Okay, but should it be the state's the decision I or I think federal? women no. should have the right okay. wherever he they just live. Meant he means completely across the board. Okay. All, right. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I clarified. Thank you. So that you didn't have to. <laughs> Your family has been uh, kind of outspoken, and you've, you've a couple of bridges have been kind of broken, right? How, how are you dealing with that? Because you had, well, I, Howie, I have a very big family, so you know. So there's and, enough that like you. Yeah, there's nice <laughs> so a, just a couple, a couple of like, there's 105 of them when that you know come to the Cape in the summer, right? And, uh, you know, I have a lot of them that are strongly supporting me. I was at a fundraiser um, four days ago in Miami that was at the home of my cousin, Anthony Shriver, who's one of my closest cousins. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I was visiting other cousins of mine in Florida yesterday as well. Oh, I have, there's, there's a, a four or five, uh, depending on how you count them, um, members of my family who have um, who are uncomfortable with my run and who have criticized me and you know I you know I listen I was raised in a, in a milieu where we were taught every night to debate each other hold opinions passionately um, and that uh, and to still love each other. Oh, I love my family. I feel that they love me. I understand why you know Biden has been a 
friend of my family's for 40, I've known uh, Joe Biden for 40 years. He was oh. one of my uncle's closest friends. You know, my uncle went down and visited him in the hospital when he was sick, when his wife died, when his son died. Daddy would take the train down there sometimes three or four times a week. See him, I, um, he's, got a, he's got a bust of my father immediately behind him in the Oval Office. I, there's five members of my family who are working with the administration. And so, yeah, I understand why people don't want me to run against them. Uh, you know, they, they're also, they differ with me on other issues. They, you know, some of my family is okay with the censorship. Some of my family is okay with the, you know, with the Ukraine war, like you. Uh, I, and I, I, I don't, I don't I, I'll I, be honest, and I don't know enough about it. It just seems that democracy is something that needs to be protected, but you're telling me it wasn't about democracy. Uh, another have, question I, mean, I have. think Ukraine is democracy? I don't know. I thought. Yeah, uh, you're when, not troubled that it's the most corrupt country in in your. I think it's the number one or two in the world. Did not know that you're saying yeah. that, but I didn't know that. But uh, another, when it, oh, go ahead. When it comes to and censorship, they silence the press. Journalists are put in jail. Uh, uh, you know, under Zelensky. Yeah. When it comes to censorship, though, you're very outspoken about being against censorship. But is there a line that you think that can be crossed when it comes to censorship in terms of, let's see racist remarks or anti-Semitic remarks that should be censored or whatever it may be. Like, what is the line? What do you decide should be censored and should not? Uh, so I, I'm a, a First Amendment absolutist, which means that there's a certain speech that's not protected. And that speech is um, it would include speeches that are... Um, that defamatory mm -hmm. against people so dishonest and you know and uh like the colleges like they were being questioned about at the colleges were those what? was that acceptable speech at, at like Which? harvard, no, well, harvard. But, but, but let me let me just explain this okay, okay. so it, but and and language that incites violence mm -hmm. is not protected so the government has a right to move in to stop that I would, if somebody said, you know, we should kill all the black people or we should genocide all the Jews, I mean, it would be uh, up to a jury to decide whether that was said in a context where it was inciting violence. Now, that's the, for the government to be involved. You know, when I, I'm suing, uh, Facebook can censor me. Mm -hmm. Instagram can censor me, and there's no First Amendment implication. But if the government orders them to censor me, then, and that's what happened, and the First Amendment is violated. So I'm just talking about the government now. There's also corporate censorship, and there are community standards that are enforced by companies. And, you know, am I okay with community standards that say we're not going to have any anti-Semitic remarks? Yeah. But what about uh, but interpreted the government? The government should not be telling. In fact, you know, I remember. But, but what about you, you? You got you got blamed for making anti-Semitic remarks. You know, and as far as the you get back to COVID, when you said the uh, Ashkenazi and the Chinese uh, people, our our biology was we were protected. Or I, I'm not sure. I, I uh, what what I said. I that said it was it, bioengineered you know, to only yeah, yeah, affect. Here's what I said. I didn't say it was bioengineered. What I said is that. It was the, the, and I was just describing a paper that was funded by NIH and published by NIH that said that the fur and cleave site on the, um, the, the docking site on the virus was perfectly aligned with certain races and was, uh, was less aligned and therefore less likely to infect other races. It's a theoretical paper it was not a paper that went out and said there's more of this group dying and there's more than that it just looked at the the, the con of the, the confirmation the construction of the docking site and said oh this was perfectly constructed for black for uh, to, to in fact the, the most affected the best fit is with blacks people of african descent the second best is caucasian the people who are least likely to have the, have the worst fit are uh, people from Finland, Ashkenazi Jews, and ethnic Chinese. So and just I, you know, saying that, okay, it sounds now, now, kind now, of let, let innocuous. Me just, let me but, say something. Well. Let me just say something. I said it in a private setting, which I was told was off the record. 
oh, I didn't know that I was being filmed. I knew that, yeah. And, you know, when it came out, I, you know, we were, we were told these are Chatham House rules. There is no discussion from here. This is a private discussion. I would, even though it was true what I said, it was not something I would say publicly because there are people okay, out there who can misuse that information that information to make blood libels against Jews. And there's a lot of those people out so there. So let me just say, but, but I'm bringing that up again. So that, that explains your position and, and, and what you did personally. But in just stating a fact, and that's what we're talking about, when people just state facts, you know, you're not calling for the genocide or, the, uh, or violence, but when people think, you could see how that could be pursue, perceived as anti-Semitic. And especially at a time like now, so you know when yeah, we go back to the freedom by, by of speech. By the way, this was this was almost what a year before Gaza, so it was you know. But not, I'm telling you, anti anti-Semitism has been around. Oh yeah, I know, I know that. You know, yeah. so and I'm well, saying, what are you asking me? I've already t explained why I said it, and under the, the context in which I no, said and it. I'm using. I'm not talking. I'm not aiming this at you. I'm saying, and I'm using that. When you're up talking to, about censorship again? When you were talking about the censorship, if you yeah. can prove that that isn't going to instill violence or it's calling for well, violence but, but, when somebody but, makes that... If somebody makes a true statement about a scientific study, I don't see any context in which that would be censored, you know, that the government should be involved in censoring that. That okay. would not be uh, right. But what I'm saying is, again, there's a difference between am I okay with you know, with corporations like Instagram, Facebook um, saying, you know, we're not going to allow pe uh, pedophilia, we're not going to allow um, uh, racist remarks, we're not allowed, we're not going to allow anti-Semitic remarks. Yeah, they can do that. And that's, you know, corporations do that all the time. The New York Times makes editorial decisions all the time and they're completely entitled to do that. And I would support them you know, limiting anti-Semitic remarks, but I, you know, I don't think the government should be involved in that. No, I, I personally don't think you're anti-Semitic. Let, let me ask I, you, know, I'm, of course I'm not, and nobody believed I was anti-Semitic. I, I, there's not a- You met your wife from Larry David. Yeah, I, and, <laughs> and I was living with him for two years at that time too, so, you know, I, 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 but not, I mean, I'm not gonna even go into, <laughs> You know, just just because my friends are, you know, I have friends that yeah, are Jews. Exactly. I'm not gonna, I, you, I did not say that on this show. I did. I never, you said it. Didn't I say okay to sitting with you? <laughs> so, uh, but let me ask you this. Okay. Um, in 1978, the Nazis marched through Skokie, Illinois, and Skokie is a place where there were at that point a lot of Holocaust survivors still alive at that time. So right. it was an area that was targeted by the Nazis. And, and the ACLU and many liberals at that time said, yeah, what they're saying is repugnant, it's abhorrent, it's disgusting, it's vile, but we have to be willing, you know, the, the question was, should they be given a parade permit by the, by the, by the government? And the question was, does the government have the right to censor people? And uh, most liberals at that time, including most Jews, said it's horrible what they're doing, but you know we have to be willing to fight for their right to do it. Because once the government gets involved in censorship, we all become potential victims. And you know, of course, the people ultimately who end up at really getting censored are the weakest and most dispossessed people in the society. So I, I, I'm just curious about whether where you land on Nazis marching through the Skokie. See, I think just by virtue, and maybe it's because of my heritage, and maybe it's because I've lost uh, people in the Holocaust, just by virtue of being called a Nazi, um, the your... Um, the value in, in waving your flag and showing up is the annihilation of my race. That just by showing up, wearing that, you know, wearing that, the, you know. So you're, you're making an argument that that alone is an incitement of violence. I think it is. I think that you can argue that. And by the way, 
Even if they don't say a word, if I see Nazis mar- marching through the street, and how do you know they're Nazis? Because you see the swastika. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they, 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 they said it's the American Nazi Party on their parade permit. And what so is their were. and what do they do? What is their purpose? What is their purpose for existence? Their purpose for existence is to make sure that I die and burn in hell, uh, isn't um, it? Yeah. So I think that's a good argument. And then uh, I don't think it's an argument. I think it's a fact. I, don't, I think a Nazi would tell you that, don't you? Well, no, because like if you talk to David Duke and those guys, what they 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 are able to, they have a kind of a marketing, well, you know. Well, you're just saying it's marketing, but they're they're truth, they're, they're real truth. truth. But, when yeah. you open up the the, you know, I heard them on, I heard David Duke talk on on Howard Stern and and a couple of other places where he said some pretty repugnant things, and knowing how. Words matter. And cult wor- leaders have good marketing too. What? Cult leaders have good marketing. That is a cult. Too. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, yeah. we, we, you're not. I, I, what, what is troubling is when the government gets involved. I think they need I don't, to. I don't think the government should get involved in regulating cults. Right? They, you know, what, what business is that at the government? Well, the government. What business is the government to be involved in? The, it isn't. Uh, doesn't. Don't we stand for the supposedly the separation of church and state? Oh, so the government shouldn't be involved in cult, you know, in regulating cults. Then whether you believe and and you're devout in whatever your religion is, that's your right. I respect that, but the government shouldn't say it, and the government shouldn't make rules based on church or or religious beliefs. Yeah, do you agree with that? Yeah, of course. But it was your daughter who's suggesting that. Um, that she wants the government to get rid of all the cults. No, country. I was making a comparison. You said they're good at marketing. The Nazi, the um, head of the Nazi group, I said, well, cults are good at not marketing. Too. Yeah. There's a lot of really bad people well, that will, want to incite horrible things that are great at marketing. Yeah. I, um, but I will point out, but of course the cults actually believe that they're, mar- that they're a lot of them believe they're marketing. So maybe. No, they, they well, I think everything's a cult. Anyway, we're, we're all in cults. We're in an esoteric yeah, yeah, right yeah we are. But let me let me just point out one thing. Okay, okay. in Germany, it is a, a criminal violation to display Nazi paraphernalia uh, iconography. Right, right, but and not they, here. And they still have a democracy, a functioning democracy. Yeah. No, you, so you agree with that? The, I do. I, I'm not. I'm not. I was asking him how oh. he felt about it because I think it's a complex. And I think his quite, his answer was actually the correct one, which, I was right. which is the very just the display of um, you know of what they were doing is intended actually to incite violence against Jews, and so you, or anybody. If you use the term white supremacy, what are you saying? Well, okay, but then now you're now you're broadening this. Well, I am. I'm saying what I'm yeah, saying I mean, is. So are you saying that we should? With the government should come in and prosecute people criminally for for saying I'm a white supremacist. No, but displaying a an act of white supremacy where if you are, I don't think they should. Uh, white, there shouldn't be a white supremacist parade. There shouldn't be the display of white supremacist flags because I think that you're inciting somebody who agrees with you that wants to uh, make the parade a little more exciting than just marching. Okay, so if the government says, and the government has a, fun, has a function here because it's issuing the parade permits. But if, it says, uh, if it says that, I mean, can it, can it also for, forbid an Islamic parade? Uh, the, 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 in, in my estimation, the idea of practicing and believing in Islam is not dangerous. The, the idea of, of being a, an extremist is dangerous. Um, but that's not what they're displaying. I, I, I have friends who are Islamic and, uh, they're not gonna... <laughs> Why are you Why? laughing? <laughs> that's like you with your Jewish <laughs> friends. <laughs> but I'm but just but that's saying that's not inciting. That doesn't not- incite. Just to say, yeah. I believe and I read the Quran and I and I believe in Islam. Like saying, but saying I'm a white supremacist is not a religion. That's a that's an activision, isn't it? Different. I, I don't. No, I I think it's a tough question. You know when the, I don't. I'm clear. <laughs> the, you know I I think they that people are allowed to say things that are abhorrent. 
and at the Hello. First Amendment was not designed to uh, to protect genteel speech or speech that everybody agrees with. It was designed to protect speech that nobody wants to hear. And so I think, and that is a sacred part of our democracy that we ought to be able to talk about. So things. you were you? Uh, how did you feel about those uh, school presidents that wouldn't? Definitely define. Well, that, that's a different issue. Because, Why isn't that the free speech? Because it's not the government. I, you know, I think that if you go onto that university campus, um, and uh, I think that, that using genocide is, in particularly at this point in history, is an incitement to violence, and we're seeing violence against Jews all over the country. I think, you know, the, the very words of embracing genocide toward Jew, Jews is a violation of, of the First Amendment. But you're also not talking about government censorship. You're talking about um, somebody who is running an institution that establishes community standards. For example, if you ran a corporation like IBM, you could make a rule in your corporation that... Um, you know, we don't want any kind of, uh, you know, displays of, of any religious affiliation at all because it makes, and you're completely within your rights to do that. Well, the question is really, you know, what is the role of a university and is a university supposed to be a haven for every kind of free speech even when it's, you know. I think it's a, it's a, it's a haven for a safe place to garner an education. And as a parent and somebody. And it's safe, like, right. And they want to make it safe. And they, so I supported the, um, you know, uh, I, I thought it was what the university presidents were saying was wrong and was abhorrent. And, okay. you know, because those university presidents are the same people who are saying, you know, we're going to shield our kids from, you know, from, uh, you know, from, from bad looks and from bad talk, et cetera. So to say that that doesn't apply to advocacy of genocide is, I think, hypocritical. So what are you doing now? What are you, you're out in the country. I I followed, I, I read you're out doing rallies everywhere. And where do they, how do they, how do people know where to find you? You're not, well, where, people follow our website, kennedy24.com. And you, right now we're, you know, right now our big challenge is getting on the ballot in 50 states. So we have to get a million signatures. And where are you in that? Well, each state has different rules, and the, the states that are already open, we are ahead of all of our projections. We've closed uh, just one state, which was the earliest deadline state, Utah, and we litigated against them to push the deadline forward, and we won that battle. Uh, we also were able to, uh, to, to file our petitions on time with double the amount of signatures that we needed. So, And so what's the deadline for you to have that? Every state has a different deadline. The a lot of them are not. A lot of them don't have deadlines till next August. Oh wow! All right, so you're. Do going you think there's any plans in the future to debate the other two candidates? Yeah, there's three debates scheduled, and they, at this point, under the rules, they have to let me into the debates because they, they have to let anybody who, who's polling at over fifteen percent. And my polling is now, you know, pretty much between. 19 and 27 percent. Is that why you made the switch? One of the reasons why you made the switch over to independent? I made the switch because they weren't going to let me. They were changing the rules to make sure I couldn't win fairly. And how's your fundraising? Fundraising is good. I mean, last quarter, uh, the campaign made more than either Trump or Biden. Wow. So now, the, you know, they have tens of millions in their super PACs. You know, we had eight, eight million and change in our campaign, uh, and they were, you know, I think six, something like that, five or six. That's impressive. And uh, are you working toward getting reinstated on the social media platforms? And are you getting? I, I, I've litigated that. I'm already back on Instagram, and and um, they've they've take. I'm still litigating against Google. Google, you know, is still censoring me. Um, but I'm. Uh, are you just totally blocked, or are they just? No, like it's shadow banning and what they elevate, and you know the algorithms that they're applying against me, and I'm, uh, you know, are designed to to, to stop keep yours down. from. Yeah, I know what shadow banning is. Reading me. Are you an X? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, that, you, you know, I can't thank you enough for coming in. You're incredibly impressive. I mean, you're, well, you're pretty educated. Uh, and in, in so many vast arrays of things from, you know. The practice with your siblings in arguing has done you very well. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. You're very sweet. Both of you to say that. I really enjoyed. Yeah, I'm fascinated them. by who you know. My uh, friends, uh, Mike Binder, called me and uh, spoke your praise and and said you should. I don't. I'm not political, and this show and this podcast is not political. And I don't. Uh, we don't talk politics. We don't talk religion. We don't talk. You know, we just usually have fun. But uh, Mike called me and said, you got to talk to this guy. So, you know, Mike Binder is pretty instrumental in my career. He, he kind of got me to the comedy store and stuff. And I'm fascinated. You're, you're kind of a dichotomy. You know, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't put you and Larry David together. In how did you guys meet? I met him because um, when they were still doing Seinfeld, um, he, uh, I, I went and met with him and Lori, his then wife, to recruit them onto um, the NRDC uh, board, which is the Natural Resource Defense Council, which was, uh, I was a senior attorney at that time, and I met them here in, uh, in Los Angeles. And then we became friends, and I ended up um, going, living at, with them at their home in Martha's Vineyard for a uh, a couple of summers, and then we went on all of our vacations together. And then, um, you know, Cheryl, he, he also, I did a big ski event back then for a, a, a pro-am celebrity ski event that I did up in Banff, up in New York country, or, or Lake Louise. Yeah. And I would have all these celebrities come up. And so Larry would always come up and he would bring people from his shows to, you know, to be part of it. And uh, he brought Cheryl one time. I'm sorry, can I make sure this is not my kids? I keep getting go, a phone go, call, go, go sorry. Ahead. You can, <laughs> but uh, what was and, I gonna say? You can leave the room. And then I actually, then he brought her back again six years later. Yeah. And by then we were both divorced. We were both getting divorced. And I, we immediately had like, had sparks. And um, I knew that Larry would, uh, you know, Larry has all these rules that nobody, you, I mean, it's not not written down, but you're supposed to know him. And I knew that he had, to, that he would be angry at me if I started dating his television wife without asking his permission. Wait, really? You had yeah, to ask? Yeah, so I went to, the, I, I went to New York and I met him at like 10 o'clock at night. To at ask York. for her hand in dating? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> was he okay? Was it right right away okay? Or? Well, he was very good with me. He he said wonderful things. He said, "I'm so happy," and he said, "She's the most, uh, she's the best human being I've ever met." He said, "She's the most beloved person in Hollywood." He said, "She's the only one in the entertainment industry that I know that doesn't have a single enemy." And uh, and so he gave me his blessing. So I was great. But then when he talked to Cheryl. Yeah. She asked him about it and he was, ah, it'll never work. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, uh, and then he did a, a replay on Curb, you know, with Ted Danson having the same conversation. Playing you. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. And he says, Ted, Ted Danson, no fucking way. <laughs> <laughs> and is he. So I know that's what he was really thinking at that time. And is he suggesting uh, uh, Michael Richards as your running mate? <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe not. Okay, you're. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming in and spending time. And uh, we plugged uh, your website, right? I will put on a. a, a Thanks link. very much, Howie. Yeah, uh, Kennedy twenty four dot com. Kennedy twenty four dot com. Uh, feel free to comment and subscribe. And uh, I can't thank you enough. This is very different for us. But uh, worth uh, our while. I feel good about it. But anyway. Well, thanks for breaking the mold and having me on. It was worth it. Okay. JFK Jr., thank you. That's it. That's good. Thank you. Jeez.